I just think we talk so much about it that we helped, I think, create somewhat of an illu illusion. Uh, I think we try to have goodwill. My old mom told me, Robert, you can't go to heaven if you hate anybody. We practice that. There are white niggers. I've seen a lot of white niggers in my time. I'm going to use that word. We all. We just need to work together to make our country a better country, and, and I just soon quit talking about it so much. I get emails from liberals all across the country who get all bent out of shape with some of the pieces I've done lately. They claim I'm using a broad brush when I call some liberals, Democrats, and their past and present policies racist. Of course, I'm not saying all Democrats are racist. That would be totally incorrect. But how does it feel? Democrats routinely call Republicans racist out of reflex. They believe their own gospel. However, things are not always what they seem. So here come the liberals to save us poll black folk again. Another golden opportunity to out a closet Republican racist, but if I may be so bold, these libs need be very careful on where they wish to go with this. They may have some splaining to do. It all started with this exchange on the September 28th broadcast of Salem Radio Network's Bill Bennett's Morning in America. Pardon me if I provide context. Assuming they're all productive citizens? Or, or assuming that they are. Uh, uh, even if even if only a portion of them were, it would it would be an enormous amount of revenue. Maybe, uh, maybe, but we don't know what the cost would be. Too, I think, does abortion disproportionately uh, occur among single women? Uh, it, no, it, I don't know the exact statistics, but uh, quite a bit are. Yes. All right. Well, I I, I mean, I just don't know. I don't. I. I I would not argue for the pro-life position based on this, and because you don't know. I mean, it, it, it cuts both. You know, one of the one of the arguments in this book, Free Economics, that they make is that the declining crime rate. You know, this they deal with this hypothesis that one of the reasons crime is down is that abortion is up. Well, uh, I don't see, think that statistic is accurate. Well, I don't think it is either. I yeah. don't think it is either because, uh, first of all, I think there's just too much that you don't that you don't know. But I, I do know that it's true that if you wanted to reduce crime, you could, if that were your sole purpose, you could abort every black baby in this country and your crime rate would go down. That would be an impossible, ridiculous, and morally reprehensible thing to do. But your crime rate would go down. So well, these far well, out, these far reaching, you know, ex extensive extrapolations are, I think, tricky. To say that Bennett advocated the abortion of black males as alleged is absurd, as are the responses by the usual liberal mouthpieces. Bennett's comments, flagged by the liberal news media watchdog group Media Matters for America, were quickly condemned by Senate Minority Leader Harry Reid, who issued a statement demanding that Bennett apologize. Representative John Conyers circulated a letter signed by 10 of his colleagues demanding that the Salem Radio Network suspend Bennett's show. Wade Henderson, the executive director of the Leadership Council on Civil Rights, demanded that the show be canceled. Bennett's statement is outrageous. As a former Secretary of Education, he should know better. His program should be pulled from the air. It's well known that Bill Bennett, being a Christian conservative, is pro-life. Thereby, as he said during his radio show exchange, aborting anyone, let alone blacks, for the sake of lowering crime 
would be an impossible, ridiculous, and morally reprehensible thing to do. I personally don't believe Bennett is this closet racist. The art of talk radio is to be able to say the most in the least amount of time. The more controversial, the better. But the main goal of any talk show host is to make people think. And he's not the only person to have ever come up with this hypothesis. Wade Henderson should know better. So let's talk about abortion in the black community, shall we? According to the statistics from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, since 1973, more than twice as many blacks have died from abortion than heart disease, cancer, accidents, violent crimes, and AIDS combined. Blacks make up about 12% of the population in the United States, but account for 32% of the abortions. And about 1,450 black infants are aborted every day in this country. Leonard Childress Jr., director of the Northeast chapter of the Life Education and Resource Network said, for every five African-American women who get pregnant, three have an abortion. In 1939, Planned Parenthood Federation founder Margaret Sanger had this great idea. Aside from keeping the Aryan race as pure as the driven snow, she felt that poor blacks contributed nothing to society and abortion may be just a good way of curbing poverty. Thus, she created the Negro Project. An editorial in the March 2005 edition of The Defender quite eloquently explains the project and how it affects blacks today. An advocate of eugenics, the science of improving races through control of hereditary factors, Ms. Sanger identified the need for birth control among the underprivileged Negroes as a primary factor in raising the economic status of the race. To this end, she was supported by many leaders in the black community who sought to cleanse the gene pool of the unfit. In the 1930s, Ms. Sanger's Negro Project offered, through contraception, a solution to the problem of too many children born into low-income, undereducated families or to single mothers who could not be expected to contribute very much to the betterment of society. As the 20th century progressed, Planned Parenthood grew in strength and political power. It gained respectability among the elite who sought to control the reproduction of the poor. Financed by endowment and taxes, it systematically placed its facilities in the poor black communities. There, as they dispensed contraceptives, these facilities waited while Planned Parenthood lobbyists sought to overthrow state and federal laws prohibiting abortion. In 1973, Roe v. Wade opened the doors to the American Holocaust and Planned Parenthood was ready. According to the Alan Guttmacher Institute, a research arm of Planned Parenthood, 94% of all abortion providers are located in metropolitan areas which generally have high black populations. Planned Parenthood does not provide a comprehensive list of its abortion clinics. However, the locations of 160 abortion facilities have been identified by the website of Stopped Planned Parenthood International, a subdivision of the American Life League. In 62% of the comparisons, communities with a Planned Parenthood clinic had a higher percentage of blacks than the state as a whole. In Delaware, Florida, Massachusetts, and Ohio, communities with Planned Parenthood clinics all had much higher black populations than their respective states. Idaho, Kentucky, North Dakota, Utah, West Virginia, and Wyoming, all with low black populations, have none of the Planned Parenthood abortion clinics. Strong pro-life forces in the two states with high black populations, Louisiana and Mississippi, have been successful in keeping out Planned Parenthood abortion clinics. A factor equal in importance to black genocide in Planned Parenthood's targeting of black communities is money. The abortion business is lucrative. Childress states, if it was not lucrative, it would not be legal. Since about one third of all abortions are performed on black women, the abortion industry has received over $4 billion from the African American community. Just as easy access to legal abortion has not solved the problem of poverty in the black community, neither have its proponents recognized, much less tried to mitigate any of the risks to women who would undergo elective abortion or to their future children. Among these are cerebral palsy, preterm birth, and the disputed link to breast cancer, an issue which refuses to go away. At least 17 studies have found that a previous induced abortion increases the risk for preterm birth, often resulting in very low birth weight, a risk factor in cerebral palsy, and other birth defects as well as infant mortality. From a 1991 meta-analysis, if one assumes the incidence of cerebral palsy in the general population 
to be two out of a thousand live births, then the relative risk for cerebral palsy among surviving very low birth weight infants would be 38 times that the general population. For the children of African American women who have undergone 14 million abortions since 1973, these risks are proportionately higher than those of their white counterparts. In recent polls, 54% of all Americans declare themselves pro-life, 44% support legalized abortion. However, 59% of black Americans took a pro-life stance with only 42% in support of abortion. Dr. Alveda King, daughter of slain civil rights leader Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., took part in the National March for Life in Washington, D.C. on January 24th. I'm post-abortive, so I know this. When we abort the child, we violate his or her rights. We as the mothers suffer tremendously, and our families suffer. If the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is to live, our babies must live. Jesse Jackson is an advocate of Planned Parenthood, and Bill Bennett is not. If one was to say that Bennett believed crime could and should be reduced by abortion, then one could also argue that liberals who support abortion believe and advocate black genocide. Do they really want to go there? Martin Luther King fled the scene. He took to his heels and disappeared, leaving it to others to cope with the destructive forces he had helped to unleash. And I hope that well-meaning Negro leaders and individuals in the Negro community in Washington will now take a new look at this man who gets other people into trouble and then takes off like a scared rabbit. I've been thinking long and hard on this one. Over the last few years, the liberal Democrat attacks on conservative blacks have increased in number and ferocity. While I'm not surprised by this or the liberal media silence over the casual use of normally taboo racial slurs directed at blacks, I'm left wondering, just why do we bother? I understand it's risky if you're a black Democrat to echo the ideas of conservative blacks that you may agree with. Groupthink is an ugly concept to go against. But as a black conservative, as a human being, I'm left asking myself, why am I going so far out of my way to try to convince those who are too lazy to pick up a book or do an internet search and see just who's been really using, thus keeping the black man and woman down? The following are a few minor bullet points, courtesy of my friend in Los Angeles, Larry Elder, and Reverend Wayne Perriman in Seattle. Democrats supported slavery and its expansion into the northern states. After the Civil War, 23 blacks, 13 of them ex-slaves, were elected to Congress, all as Republicans. That the first black Democrat was not elected to Congress until 1935 from the state of Illinois. That the first black congressional Democrat from a southern state was not elected until 1973. That Democrats in 1854 passed the Kansas-Nebraska Act that overturned the Missouri Compromise and allowed for the importation of slaves into the territories. Democrats opposed Senate Bill 60 of 1866 to give blacks 40 acres and a mule. It was Democratic President Andrew Johnson that vetoed the bill. Democrats opposed the 1866 Civil Rights Act. On July 4, 1867, in Houston, 150 blacks and 20 whites formed not the black Texas Republican Party, but the Texas Republican Party. Blacks across southern states also founded the Republican parties in their states. In 1850, Democrats passed the Fugitive Slave Law. President Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation during the Civil War. In 1865, the 13th Amendment Emancipating the slaves was passed with 100% of Republicans voting for it and only 23% of Democrats voting for it. The 14th Amendment was passed giving the newly emancipated blacks full civil rights and federal guarantee of those rights, superseding any state laws. Every single voting Republican voted for the amendment. No Democrat voted for it. Congress passed the 15th Amendment in 1870, guaranteeing blacks the right to vote. Every single Republican voted for it, with every single Democrat voting against it. During 1872 congressional investigations, 
Democrats admitted beginning the Ku Klux Klan as an effort to stop the spread of the Republican Party and to reestablish Democratic control in southern states. Blacks who were all Republican at that time were the primary targets of violence. Southern Democrats like Al Gore Sr. and William Fulbright debated against the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. Southern Democrats, including Al Gore Sr. and William Fulbright, debated against the passage of the 1965 Voting Rights Act. Democrats supported and participated in burning down middle-class black communities like those in Rosewood, Florida, Wilmington, North Carolina, and the Greenwood District, Black Wall Street, in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Between 1870 and 1875, the Republican Congress passed many pro-black civil rights laws. But in 1876, Democrats took control of the House and no further race-based civil rights laws passed until 1957. In 1892, Democrats gained control of the House, the Senate, and the White House, repealed all of the Republican-based civil rights laws. That enabled the Southern Democrats to pass the Jim Crow laws, poll taxes, literacy tests, and so on in their individual states. Only 64% of Democrats in Congress voted for the 1964 Civil Rights Act, while 80% of Republicans voted for the act. Democrats, in an effort to keep blacks in their place, used sadistic torture, terror, and violence, including lynching, mutilations, murder, decapitations, beatings, and burning to death countless numbers of blacks. Despite this material being readily available to anyone who shook off the label of acting white, actually learn to read and can find this untaught American history easily, many blacks consider it the easy way out to just blame all their problems on racism. Ever wonder why conservative blacks are always called sellouts while liberal blacks like Jesse Jackson get a paycheck for being a racism watchdog? I've always wondered why he goes after any cause that will get him on the television or he targets corporations that will pay him off personally to make him go away. Jackson ignores the real problems in the black community because should they become cured, he'll lose his livelihood. So you may ask, what does the title of this segment mean, Time to Move On? There's that old expression about bringing the horse to water and trying to make it drink. Black conservatives have been spitting into the wind for years now, trying to wake up the sleeping black electorate to the sins of those whom consider themselves the party of civil rights. We have attempted to point our brethren in the right direction, pardon the pun, and have been called Sambos, Uncle Toms, Lapdogs, and those slurs yet to be repudiated by those in the mainstream media or academia. Maybe we should just consider some a lost cause and just move on. There are some who enjoy their victim status and use it as a way of blaming others for their own laziness. There are many black folk out there who have used the education system to their benefit and are now self-reliant. They don't depend on a check from the government every month and they are the true leaders in their community. There are those who live by blaming whites for their every misfortune, while they now have to live with the ramifications of their blowing off school earlier in life. They claim affirmative action will cure those ramifications. All affirmative action does is make every black person's qualifications suspect upon their first day at a new job and discriminate against persons who may be more qualified purely because of the color of their skin. Liberal blacks call that payback. Just who is perpetuating racism and discrimination in America? Those who believe rap music and sports are the only way out of a crime-ridden neighborhood can choose to live that fool's paradise while condemning others who choose to study. The entertainment industry can celebrate so-called adversity, but many of our hardcore street personalities actually came from middle-class backgrounds and made sound business decisions to get from point A to point B. Those who wish to elevate themselves must make a choice. Personal responsibility is not a catchphrase. It's a way of life that gives someone real control over their lives. Going to work isn't selling out. Not impregnating or being impregnated before age 14 isn't selling out. Teaching your kids that school and not the streets is the path to success isn't selling out. Selling out is taking a dump on the very opportunities this country has to offer and making something out of your dream sitting on your butt and blaming whites and your, for your failings and demanding a monetary payoff is a waste of time because it will never happen. There are too many successful blacks in this nation to disprove the wildly held notion that racism is keeping us all down. For those of you who decide to take control of your lives, there is a home for you. 
I know it's been hard to stay in the closet because almost all around you would shun you or worse. But that closet is filling up and soon there will be no place for independent blacks but to go out and up. I have a lot of outtakes on this show. One last time. Another golden opportunity to out. But if I may be so bold, these libs me. Now while I would have more Wade Henderson, according to the statistics from the A solution to the problem of had a higher percentage of blacks than us. Neither has, neither have. Just as eager with this very low birth weight. 59% of black, black Americans. If one was to say that Ben, I was invited to address a local Republican's women's to the seriousness of the charge, charge change. It is only a few, 